our body, you know, starts with DNA. That DNA creates RNA, which creates proteins and peptides. And so whenever we're designing these drugs, we're really mimicking body's natural processes. As far as weight loss, of course, the, the growth hormone secretagogues are very helpful. They, they help with body recomposition. Those peptides which can increase growth hormone by encouraging your pituitary to release growth hormone. This is one that was done in athletes before it was really done anywhere else. Um, with the idea that if we can increase mitochondrial function, you could increase performance. Okay, welcome to the Dr. Joy Kong podcast. Now, I'm so excited to have Ryan Smith with me today. Ryan, you are a superstar. Uh, I'm just so excited to to you know be able to learn from you. Um, so first of all, welcome. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for having me. Excited to talk peptides. Yes. So I know there are a lot of subjects that you can go into. Um, so there are two things that we probably can talk about, but today we're going to focus on peptides. Um, so first I want to introduce Ryan a little bit. Um, so Ryan is, you know, it, it, right now you're focusing on true diagnostic, but, um, but just going back a little further, you, um, you went to university, um, uh, studying biochemistry, and then you went to medical school in 2013. So that was 10 years ago and you <laughs> passed the U S MLE step one, and then you <laughs> left medical school and opened up a pharmacy, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> that's quite interesting. And, and you were focusing on peptide synthesis and formulations and that pharmacy happens to become hugely successful, tailor-made, uh, a beautiful company. You know, you, you guys have so much very nicely put out information, helping a lot of practitioners. The company became the fourth largest growing company in healthcare in the U.S. and grew to $80 million within three years. Um, and with that pharmacy, you saw the value of preventative medicine and um, and you with the uh, you know physicians that Taylor made was uh, working with, uh, there was a lot of um, um, uh, you know efforts in treating age as a disease. So that kind of prompted you to see uh, a need for better tool to assess aging. Is, is that correct? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And that's when you exited Taylor made in mm -hmm. 2020 and um, founded. True diagnostic, which is very exciting because you created this uh, uh, biological age measurement testing, mm -hmm. and that has become very successful. You're working with you know huge number of patients um, in studies and mm -hmm. and very big reputable um, universities and, and institutions like Harvard and Yale and Duke. So um, so that's why I say you're a superstar because um, you're still very young and to be able to found these two powerful companies and make them successful, I'm just so impressed by you. <laughs> well, you, you two kind of got lucky a little bit um, as well, but uh, I think that Hey, you know, one of the one of the fun things is always driven by really cool science. And so I think that that's what we'll get into today, at least to some degree, is uh, why, why I was so excited about these two areas right. and hopefully why everyone else should be as well. I need to hear the story of what happened when you were in medical school, <laughs> taking your exams. And then what happened? You decided <laughs> to go down to pharmacy. So there, there's a there's a good no. story. Yeah, well, you know, I just realized I didn't want to be in medicine, unfortunately. I think that it's a sad story. I think that the world of medicine that I knew existed um, was sort of treating sick care. Um, you know, I, we, I was working at the University of Kentucky where we were, you know, seeing patients who were maybe seeing physicians for the first time in 10 years, you know, people who really only come into the hospital because they absolutely needed it as an emergency. Um, and it was pretty sad for me. I felt like I was just sort of managing care. I was, uh, you know, sort of just checking off a list. And if I had known this world of preventative uh, medicine existed, this, this uh, market where people are you know, trying to optimize themselves rather than, you know, trying to uh, just wait for disease to occur. I, I think I would have certainly stayed with it, but I had no idea at the time that that, that, that really existed. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and really, I, the pharmacy, a lot of my background in undergrad had been in peptide and protein biosynthesis. So doing recombinant chemistry, like growing up particular peptides or proteins and you know, E. coli, expressing them, purifying them, doing things like X-ray crystallography, 
um, as well as solid based synthesis for shorter chain uh, amino acid proteins or peptides. Um, and so I had some experience in that. And whenever um, you know I was considering this pharmacy, just sort of lucked into it. Uh, we, we knew we wanted to do some really innovative peptides that weren't widely available here. Um, and we started launching a lot of products which people weren't really familiar with. So we had to do a little bit of education to the market. Um, we we tried to sort of teach physicians about all these different products and then we just really hit a niche, I think. Uh, I think uh, a lot of physicians and patients saw some of the really positive benefits of some of these therapies and uh, and it really just grew from there. Yeah. Well, when I was in medical school, no one, no one told me about peptides, but it was going on, right? So the Russians had been developing them since 1980s. How come you knew about it? And I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> you know, so I hate, I hate to say it, but I'll, even I was never taught about it either. And even with the things I do today with epigenetics, I think I had one day on epigenetics as, as an undergrad. And so a lot of these topics I was never necessarily taught, but um, always had, a, I would say, a an eye for sport and biochemistry and, you know, athletes, particularly even, you know, the Russian athletes, um, you know, uh, have been using a lot of these products for, for performance related benefits for a long time. Um, and so uh, they had been out there, not frequently well described or, or even widely used, but um, was always sort of an interesting. In medical school, you heard about these athletes using these peptides? Yeah. Well, essentially, you know, was, I was uh, sort of, you know, doing this peptide research and looking for, for peptides to be interesting to make or create. Um, and as I was looking for it, um, I was sort of, I guess, drawn or attracted to some of that performance enhancing um, aspect of it. Um, and so that's when I started to become a little bit more familiarized with it. Um, and then, uh, you know, really just grew from there. Okay, so this is around 2010, right? Is, is around yeah. 2010 and you, a lot of athletes were already using uh, <laughs> performance mm -hmm. enhancing peptides. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, the, you know, the growth hormone secreting receptors and growth hormone releasing hormone uh, peptides are probably one of the best examples. Um, those have been really used even since as really as 1996 in athletes um, trying to do some performance enhancing um, related uh, uh, administration. So, so yes, and, and the field has only gotten you know much more advanced as this sort of uh, expansion of peptides has occurred, and and that is going now at a at a very wide rate with more peptides approved um, than any other type of class of drug molecule. I see. Yeah. I have a lot of questions about that. Mm -hmm. um, just where do you think at the FDA is at with peptides mm -hmm. and what's the big pharma's attitude when it comes to peptides? Yeah, well, so so I think that um, our definition in this space of peptides has been a little bit obscured uh, because the FDA and, and Big Pharma wouldn't necessarily have the same definition. For them, uh, a drug is a drug, whether or not it's a small molecule drug or it's a biologic drug or if it's a peptide-based drug. Um, and so generally, um, though the, the, the Big Pharma world and even the FDA hasn't seen a lot of peptides. And the rationale for that is because uh, small molecule drugs, which are more stable um, and more bioavailable, those drugs have always been pushed to market first by a lot of these big companies. So I, I always mention like Viagra um, as a good example, right? Viagra is a small molecule drug that readily absorbs. Um, it can be taken orally. It's really easy. And, and pharma companies have known this. And, and so it has a great market impact. Vice versa, peptides have always had a little bit of a few weaknesses. Um, one is certainly bioavailability. Um, you know, most of them are not going to survive the transit through the stomach acid. Um, so generally, they have to be injected. That makes them a little bit less advantageous for, for wide market rollout. Um, in addition to that, oftentimes they have very, very short half lives so they don't stay around in the blood that long. And that means you might have to do frequent injections. And so that has made them really, uh, I would say, uh, Big Pharma and other companies sort of stay away from them um, because they have a little bit too, uh, they're, they're too hard to, to package or to control in, in a product that is very easy to distribute across the world. And so, um, so this has really been why small molecule drugs have really taken um, the, the focus for several decades. But now we're starting to see the shift. And the reason being is that all those weaknesses that we thought peptides had um, are now being corrected and we're left only with the peptide strengths. Um, and those things like, uh, you know, being metabolized very, very predictably, not having a lot of drug to drug interactions, having a, a, a lot of specificity for individual targets. And so those all those problems are now fixed, which now makes peptides very exciting. And now we have a huge area of focus for for big pharma and the FDA. And so we're starting to see that peptide approvals are becoming a lot more frequent, 
unfortunately, uh, a lot of peptides are really great products, but are in this sort of area of limbo where they're not being developed, um, but they still have really useful uh, potential in the market. And so that's where compounding pharmacies really stepped in to be able to produce some of those products um, that were not technically FDA approved, uh, but, but still had a lot of great clinical application. Okay, so are you saying that uh, they're solving the problem that is so it does not have to be injectable and it does not have to be injected frequently anymore? Yeah, a good example are the the, the glucagon-like uh, uh, peptides, uh, like the semaglutide, as everyone you know is familiar with now, probably the Ozempic. Yeah. Um, you know, prior to that, the, those drugs had to be injected once daily, like the liraglutide, and now you only have to do it once weekly. And the reason that those are getting better are because we're making them more stable and, and longer acting in the blood. So that's a good example. And now you can even take semaglutide orally um, uh, as well. And so uh, so we're correcting some of those issues with really great science. Um, and that's making peptides much, much more popular. Wow. So when they, in the process of making these a little bit more accessible and easier to handle, are they changing the structure to the point that is not natural anymore? You know, like the strict yeah. expense of the natural? <laughs> Yeah, so so the, these uh, that's the great thing about I would say the the biochemistry just generally is our body you know starts with DNA that DNA creates RNA which creates proteins and peptides and so whenever we're designing these drugs we're really mimicking body's natural processes um, and so they can be very natural and at first they were some of the earliest peptides were things like insulin um, right uh, you know synthetic insulin uh, mimicking exactly what the body had but then we we got uh, more advanced and, and by changing that natural product we can make just a very small amount of changes but for large benefit um so going back to those growth hormone secretagogue peptides those those peptides which can increase growth hormone by encouraging your pituitary to release growth hormone um that started out just mimicking exactly our endogenous growth hormone releasing hormone that comes from our hypothalamus uh, but then we started to substitute some amino acids um, and by doing that we increased the half-life so instead of just eight minutes of stimulation we might get 30 um, or even longer and so by doing that, we are changing them from their natural structure. So we're getting rid of that, the, what is sort of equivalent for the, for the body's production, but we're tweaking them just enough to have the same effect, but to have better pharmaceutical profiles. Okay, that could be some people's pet peeve because mm -hmm. you know so much of what we've been seeing with all these pharmaceutical drugs is unwanted side effects. Uh, mm -hmm. Because when you tweak nature, then you can end up having all kinds of unforeseen consequences. So do you see that as happening with these peptides? Um, for some of them, I, I think that's certainly a possibility. Um, and, but I think that you know, a lot of the peptides that are widely in use now um, don't have as many uh, of those because they've gone through such rigorous testing. Um, but there, there are, are quite a few, I think, that would have some unintended consequences. Um, but I think, again, that's the great thing about these peptides is, is they have a wide range of applicability. You could go with the bioidentical, uh, use the exact same thing. You might mean you have to inject more. It might mean that you have to, uh, you know, inject more uh, or frequently or inject at all. But, um, but you can really go back to those basic biochemical principles and really mimic what your body is doing. Okay. So I'm curious, um, you know, in our clinic we provide, you know, over 20 peptides. Um, I do wonder how many of those have been slightly tweaked. Um, what about hot C? Cause that's the one that you need to inject once a week, right? So that's, that, that has been tweaked. <laughs> so the MOTC, the MOTC is actually a, uh, just like the endogenous MOTC, that mitochondrial peptide. So it is, uh, it is still identical to the one that's produced in your body. Okay, that's really good news. That's very comforting since I just injected <laughs> some into myself earlier today. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah, that, that is one of the few exceptions. Okay, all right. So when you see when big pharma um, start to tweak these peptides and then um, and then sell them as pharmaceuticals, um, do you see that as a huge um, you know step forward to help the peptide industry? Uh, or do you see that as possibly squeeze out, you know, the the more natural forms of peptides? Because yeah. I, I assume that the big pharma cannot um, patent completely natural molecules, correct? Yeah, when I think that um, unfortunately, to get a drug to market right now, it it takes over two point three billion dollars, mm -hmm. um, and that is a lot of money, and a lot of money that most people or most companies would not have. 
And so unfortunately, a lot of what drugs are going to market are still controlled by the people that would have that financing. And that tends to be these large drug companies. And so um, what we're starting to see, I think, is a pattern is that a lot of early drug work is done and then sold or licensed to these larger pharmaceutical companies. And so um, so generally, uh, I, I think that that's a relatively good thing because they have the, the, the time and, and resources to bring something to market. Um, but as I mentioned, there are quite a few exceptions where we know that the products are, are really great, but they tend to be not brought to market. Uh, Ifamorolin is a good example. Even early with Samorolin, um, you know, I think that that's the, um, a, a good example as well. All these growth hormone secretagogues, which have really good clinical impact, um, but are never really brought to market. Um, and so I think that uh, there's some pros and cons of both, but uh, I would say generally uh, the, there's really no other way to bring them to wide use. And so I think you have to go to these pharmaceutical companies. And it has to go a little bit of synthetic route, basically. It's almost always synthetically produced, um, but it doesn't always have to be uh, different from the product that we would endogenously produce in our body. But I, I would say that most of the time it is just to make sure that, uh, again, we're, we're eliminating any of those concerns that typically happen with the peptides. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So... Um... You know, maybe we we uh, give people an idea of some of the peptides that um, that has been the most popular. So, when you first got started, you said um, one of the earliest ones were the growth hormone promoting peptides, right? So, yeah. the somorolin was the earlier one, right? Mm -hmm. the Correct. And that's just actually a, a, just a, a fragment of your natural endogenous growth hormone releasing hormone. Um, it's just a 29 amino acid fragment of that, of that same product. And mm -hmm. so that was certainly, I would say that class, the growth hormone secretagogues were certainly the biggest class that we originally started with. Um, and the reason being is that unlike growth hormone, they were less expensive. Um, they didn't have contraindications for prescribing off-label like growth hormone does by the FDA. Um, and they generally didn't have a lot of side effects, such as you couldn't overdose them, for instance, and have any of the side effects you might have if you dose growth hormone a little bit too high. And so it really was a, a good alternative um, to be able to help with adult growth hormone deficiencies um, while still uh, avoiding maybe the more expensive and uh, certainly the, the more heavy handed product in growth hormone. Mm -hmm. And then there are newcomers that came along. Um, so in my clinic, I, I do like the combination of Ipramorlin and CJC 1295. So what do you think of that combination versus Samorlin? Yeah, so I, so I think it was definitely a step in the right direction. So, um, you know, here we go to a little bit of terminology um, aspect, but uh, CJC-1295 um, is also goes by the name of mod GRF um, of 129. And, and uh, so basically what they did is they took that 29 amino acid sequence of, uh, of ipamorolin, or sorry, of, uh, of samorolin, and they substituted out just uh, essentially four amino acids. And so that's all that happened is four amino acids changed, but the binding time on the pituitary uh, essentially uh, almost tripled. Um, and so you got a lot more secretion of growth hormone um, with really the same type of dosing. And so that was certainly a step in the right direction. Um, people call it also CJC because uh, technically it's slightly different than that mod GRF, uh, but it was developed by a company called Conjugem. And this is a company that does really one thing, which they attach a small molecule product to these peptides to give it even longer lasting um, uh, in the blood system. And so people might say CJC with DAC or the drug activity complex. And when they do, they're, they're talking about actually that, that, that little addition given by Conjugem which actually means you only have to dose it once per week, uh, a little bit more like that semaglutide. And so um, so those were certainly a step in the right direction, but I think ultimately it culminates in probably what I think is the best growth hormone secretagogue, which is the tessamorolin. Oh, really? Okay. We do use that in the clinic, mm -hmm. um, it, it, mostly for weight loss purposes, uh, yeah. but, but you think that may be even better than ipromorolin and CJC combined? Yeah, certainly. Well, I think that uh, the IGF-1 benefits are certainly larger. The average increase in IGF-1 with testimorolin is, is on average 181 points, um, which is, you know, a very large increase. And, uh, and so I think that depending on how much growth hormone stimulation you need, um, it's certainly a good avenue. But uh, the reductions in visceral adipose tissue, the uh, improvements in cognition, uh, the reduction in carotid into a media thickness, all of those are benefits which have been really heavily um, uh, proven with the tessamorolin. Mm, okay. Um, and does that one come with DAC as well? 
It doesn't. Um, so it, it is actually a 44 amino acid peptide. Um, and it's got a, a, a small lipid molecule at the end. Um, and uh, that gives it a really good stability um, and gives it really good potency. That's why you're seeing such you know large increases of IGF-1. Um, because when you stim stimulate that pituitary, you're producing growth hormone, creates IGF-1 in the liver, and you have really, really potent effects. So you personally, I mean, if you are going to take a growth hormone, you know, secrete a gog, you will go for tesamorelin. I would, yes. Um, yeah, I think that it is is certainly the the largest effect. I might not do the full dose. Um, I don't know that, uh, you know, my IGF-1 tends to be very low anyway, um, but uh, I might do a half milligram instead of, uh, you know, one milligram dose or a two milligram dose. But, but yes, I think that it is certainly uh, one of the most potent and effective. Okay. And if somebody is buying something like epromorelin CJC, and you would you would say go ahead and use the the one with DAC. Um, I would say without DAC actually. Without. Um, yeah, okay. and so yeah, so that's an interesting um, um, distinction, and I'm glad you asked because I wouldn't have really gone into it. But um, I think that sometimes that long term stimulation, a week of stimulation, is not always what should happen. Um, so in the case of growth hormone, we have this very uh, uh, diurnal patterns, right? So whenever we go to sleep, we see the biggest increase. And then, you know, when we wake up, it's generally much lower. With things like this CJC with, with the DAC, you get so much stimulation, you miss a little bit of that circadian rhythm generated pulse of growth hormone. And so it's a little bit less natural, I think, going back to some of the questions you were asking earlier. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that uh, generally, if I were going to do the CJC up more in combination, I would do it uh, uh, instead of the DAC, and I would do it every night before bed to mimic that natural growth hormone peak. Right. And then how important it is to have a two-day break, because we tell people to do five nights a week. Yeah, certainly. So, so that is um, the we sort of started that convention very early with with true mm -hmm. or uh, tailor made uh, compounding, and and uh, we did it because we didn't want to develop a resistance or tolerance to growth hormone secretion. Um, and doing that process, we never saw that, that actually happen. Um, but with that being said, I think that we saw that you can even do it sometimes more frequently, as long as it's not an extended duration, um, then you generally are probably not going to have problems with down regulation. And even so, um, with daily injections. Yeah. And, and, you know, at one point in time, we had people who were dosing it, um, you know, up to three times per day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, once at night. For, for several weeks on end. And we still saw that they were having reliable increases in growth hormone um, with the administration. I wouldn't recommend that, but but I think that uh, it's probably best practices to still have uh, to still have two days off uh, most days. And what's your philosophy on how long a person should stay on, you know, pep let's just say that the growth hormone sec yeah. secretagogues? Yeah, so I think every peptide is different, but for the growth hormone secretagogues, I uh, probably more, I'm, I'm urging a little bit more caution um, than I used to uh, whenever we were first doing this. Um, and the reason being, I think, is some of my priorities have changed a little bit um, as it relates to what outcome you're really looking to seek. Um, you know, I think with growth hormone stimulation, you're driving a proliferative growth process. Um, and, and I think that uh, that might not always be the thing that you want. Um, you know, I think that there's now another side of the coin, especially from a longevity perspective, where you might want to to sometimes have those periods, but then and other times you might want to have more restrictive periods of growth uh, where you're being more uh, conservative um, in some of those processes for better longevity. And so um, I think that, uh, you know, you could stay on them for a long time without really any negative effect. But I think, um, you know, my, my philosophy has changed, maybe doing it, uh, you know, three months on, maybe three months off or something similar to that. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah, that's super helpful. Yeah. And what about some other peptides? I think, um, you know, of course, the, the most popular one, I would say, is BPC-157, mm -hmm. TB-500, right? They become very yeah. famous. I'm sure all the athletes are using it. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about these two? Yeah, certainly. So um, the, the thymus and beta, or the TB-500, is actually funny. Uh, um, uh, the TB-500 actually was named um, based off of a horse uh, product, a veterinary product, which was given to help racehorses um, recover from injury. Um, and so that's how it became the name TB500, sort of like a, a brand name um, that was really built in the veterinary world. And when it started in the veterinary world, it went to the bodybuilding world, uh, which is why um, it sort of, sort of kept the name TB500. But the thymus and beta-4 is really the real name of that product. And that's a product that is mimics exactly the same product that is produced by our own bodies um, uh, naturally. 
Um, and it is a great repair product. It are is. They, uh, are they the same? Yeah. <laughs> is so, there still controversy? <laughs> are they? Yeah. So the, there's a, a, a lot of uh, thymus that are fragments um, that still have biological activity that are sometimes shorter. And so um, the the TP500 it really is, a, I would say, a ubiquitous for anything that has to do with the thymus and beta-4. Um, uh, but, uh, but technically, the TP500 as a, as a Technical designation doesn't exist. It's just a, a brand name. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. So it's just a brand name for TB4. Correct. It's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, and then the, uh, you know, what do you think the fact that a lot of people are using the two together? Do you think that they are synergies when the two are used together? Certainly. The, the 157 yeah. TB500. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they're both great recovery products uh, for repair and recovery and and have so many different applications. I'm really actually excited for the Thymus and Beta 4 because that one's actually very close to FDA approval, um, which is uh, is interesting. The BPC, on the other hand, is very far away, uh, but but I, I, I like both of them a lot. And I've used both of them uh, myself to repair and recover from sports injuries. I've seen miraculous changes to help prepare from surgery-related outcomes. Um, and so I am a big fan of both of them. And they both act uh, very differently. Um, uh, and so I generally would say that the thymus and beta-4 profile is a little bit more soft tissue and, mu and, and muscle mass, um, whereas the, the BPC is really good at reducing inflammation and better with tendons and ligaments. Um, and so I think that together they can, can both have a synergistic effect to have really great repair and recovery. Hmm, interesting. Are they both good for bones or, or the BPC is a better one for, for bone health? Yeah, so I would say that the BPC is slightly better for bone health, um, uh, but uh, but you know I, I think that uh, there's some very very few studies for bone health for either of them. Um, but uh, but again, I think for repair and recovery, they're both going to help. Um, anything that needs vascular circulation, um, the thymus and beta four is is really a good product for. Okay, so the the thymus and beta four is good for for circulation. Um, yeah, so what, one of the main things that it's doing is increasing um, proteins like uh, VEGF, which help with angiogenesis and bringing blood flow to new areas. Um, and and so, um, so, yeah, anything that would require, um, you know, angiogenesis uh, or, you know, accelerated wound healing, that is where thymus and beta-4 is really going to, uh, to be a star. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and do you think that they're both good for cardiovascular health? Yeah, much more the thymus and beta-4 again, I, I think. Um, the thymus and beta-4 uh, has many studies in, in, in cardiac issues and improvements. Um, and so, again, dealing with more angiogenesis, um, you know, in, 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 and so this, it's really perfect for a cardiac type of application. Okay. And what about, I think there's a little bit of a, you know, a difference in opinions about whether or not to inject these peptides directly mm -hmm. into the soft tissue or joints. Um, different practitioners have different ideas. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I will say that there aren't really any studies um, comparing one to the other. So I think that most of what we know tends to be anecdotal. Um, and and uh, I would say that in my personal opinion, um, I haven't seen a ton of applications where injections into the tissue may, plays a major benefit um, outside of just dosing regularly. Um, but with that being said, uh, there are a few exceptions, I think, uh, especially in, in you know, avascular areas. And, and uh, I think that even in, in particularly cosmetic procedures, um, there, there are some benefits of injecting locally, but I don't think it's absolutely needed. Hmm. Okay. Cosmetic procedures utilizing... Uh, Thymus and beta-4? Yeah, certainly. So a lot of people will, uh, I would say, use thymus and beta-4 or, or even the BPC um, as it's going to help improve collagen synthesis, particularly that type 1 collagen synthesis. Um, and so a lot of people will, will microneedle it, for instance, into faces. Um, a lot of people will, uh, you know, after plastic surgery, try and inject it locally. Um, uh, so there, there are a couple of cosmetic applications I've seen that have been really effective. Very interesting. Yeah, because of course we we hear most about the GHK copper for mm -hmm. cosmetic use. Um, do you think that copper component sometimes causes problems with patients? Um, I, I would say if you're dosing it too high, certainly. Um, so uh, you know, you you can one of the, the main features of this is that people start to see the lumina of their nails turn blue. That that little white circle. That's you you know you have way too much copper and you might need to chelate it. Um, but uh, but generally, I think that. 
um, it's going to be hard to dose it that high, especially if you're doing it in a non-injectable format, like a topical application, um, then uh, you, you're probably not going to have any issues with copper. Um, but sometimes if you're injecting it, uh, you can certainly have some of those issues where you're having too much copper. Um, and, and I think that there's, there's an important balance between GHK regularly, the tripeptide, and then the GHK with copper. Um, uh, Lauren Pickard, who, who really was the creator of the GHK, does, talks a lot about their different profiles. He talks about GHK, for instance, increasing stimness of stem cells, making them more available, whereas the GHK copper, more differentiating stem cells to be able to help repair and recover into the necessary tissue. So there's there's certainly a balance there that needs to be struck, but I think that uh, it's very rare that people will probably overdose the copper uh, too much uh, so that it would cause a problem. Yeah, or adverse reaction to the copper. I'm not sure if that has, has occurred. Um, yeah. So, are they both naturally occurring? The GHK and yeah. GHK, copper. Okay, a absolutely. The, the copper is uh, is relatively well attracted to that tripeptide. So you have to really make a point uh, to to make sure <laughs> that it, it's not binding to the copper. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. Well, that can only find out from a real bio biochemist. <laughs> <laughs> and then I want to ask you about weight loss peptides. Of course, that's hugely popular, right? Uh, mm -hmm. People uh, <laughs> people are desperate for weight loss, and now they have this exciting new tool that everybody is, is, is getting, mm -hmm. you know, thanks to the Kardashians. Um, <laughs> and um, to the point where there's now phrases like the, uh, what's it called, Ozempic face, when mm -hmm. people <laughs> lose too much weight, then their face, you know, is slimming yeah. down rapidly, and then there's drooping. I mean, it's a new cultural phenomenon. Um, so, so in our clinic, um, as far as weight loss, of course, the the growth hormone secretagogues are very helpful. They they help with body recomposition, um, and then there are a few other ones. So, so that would be you know in our clinic the ipomorelin CJC, tesamorelin. Um, and then there are these other ones. So I want to kind of ask you a little bit. So the most famous is semaglutide, which is yeah. ozempic. Some people have scoured the internet and looking for mm -hmm. problems and, and have found a few. Um, mm -hmm. In general, it's extraordinarily safe, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, certainly. But um, there's been reports of pancreatitis, correct? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what other things that may be of concern? Yeah, so certain relationships to certain types of cancers, like the MEN cancers, um, uh, are really big contraindications. Um, but I would say on a on a daily basis, uh, the things that people are going to experience the most generally tend to relate to those GI issues that that, that accompany uh, the semaglutide, and and it's also why they tend to have to be titrated up. And so I would say that for the large majority, they're not going to experience. Some of the issues, like any type of cancer-related issue, or or uh, any even in, even the pancreatitis, which is uh, more common uh, than than some of those other um, relatively uh, um, common effects, like the GI effects, the constipation, for instance, um, or nausea. I think being the two most common. Okay, you're saying the the pancreatitis is very uncommon. Is that? But yeah, no, I was just gonna say the pancreatitis happens. It's not unheard of, but it's not nearly as common as as nausea um, and or constipation, which generally tend to be the, the biggest side effects. Okay, and what about people also ask about uh, rebound weight gain or mm -hmm. just going back to their original mm -hmm. weight or maybe even heavier than what they were before? But you know what? What I hear is that if they are eating healthy, they're not going to get back to the previous weight. So, what what are your thoughts? Yeah. So, so generally, I think the data shows that there is a slight rebound of weight. Um, but I think that the assumption is that uh, they're probably not having those same healthy eating habits. And the reason being is a lot of the the effect size of, of some of these GLP ones are through appetite reduction, um, where they're not eating as much, they're not intaking as much food. And so I think that when people stop, sometimes their diet also shifts. So it's always hard to have a control trial where you're incorporating that and, and seeing about weight loss. But if you, um, I think that if you can keep up those good diet and lifestyle related um, uh, habits, I think that you probably will gain very little weight back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. what are the other benefits for, for Ozempic or semaglutide besides the weight loss? Yeah. So, uh, so I, I think that number one of which is the insulin sensitivity, um, being responsive to insulin. And, and this is something that has received a little bit of controversy 
especially lately, um, because some people think that it might be actually worsening some insulin um, uh, resistance problems. But I think that, um, you know, it's, again, it's controversial, but I think that that anything that is helping improve your insulin response is great. Um, I think, uh, you know, now that I work in, in specifically in the, in the field of longevity with true diagnostic, I think that, uh, you know, we have a saying that that uh, almost everyone develops diabetes if they live long enough um, with this mm -hmm. insulin resistance related issue. Wow. And so things like the semaglutide, which help improve our response to blood sugar, um, or even some other, you know, diabetes related medications, like uh, some of the SGL2 inhibitors, which help you sort of uh, pee out glucose in your urine. All of those things tend to have, uh, I would say, a positive impact on longevity. So that's one of my favorite things about the semaglutide. Mm, wow, that's great. And what about MOTC? I remember we talked about that before. And you, you do uh, you do like that peptide quite a bit. Yeah, so I love the MOTC. And, and actually, this is one that was done in athletes before it was really done anywhere else um, with the idea that if we could increase mitochondrial function, you could increase performance. Um, and and so, uh, so we really even started in athlete use before it was even widely available to the medical field. Um, and so I love the, the, the MOTC. I think especially... Um, in theory, but I think that the practical application of dosing is sometimes difficult. Um, you know, know how much to dose and, and how frequently to dose. A lot of those studies really haven't been done to the point they need to. And I, I think that probably at the moment, uh, people are probably uh, underdosing the MOTC, not doing it as frequently as they should or not doing it to the, the high enough dose. And I think that to get to a really great therapeutic effect, you probably would have to spend a lot of money um, to, be <laughs> able, to be able to dose that appropriately. Well, what will be a really good dose then? You know, so I think that, uh, again, it's, it's all conjecture, um, unfortunately, because we don't have much data. The data that we do have is from, uh, for instance, even people like children who are developing type 2 diabetes early in life and then have suppression of their endogenous MOTC production. Um, and, and so, uh, so it's, it's difficult to say, but I think that, uh, you know, whenever we rolled it out of TaylorMade, we were doing very, very light dosing um, and we were doing it three times per week. And I think that generally 10 milligrams even twice a day um, would be uh, more toward a dose that I think you'd start to see really good efficacy, especially even for performance. Um, and, and so I think that um, instead, one of my favorite products for mitochondrial benefit outside of the MOTC, given those issues, is the SS31. Um, the SS31 is, is hard to find sometimes, but I, uh, I would say it, it tops my list of all of the peptides. Hmm. Okay. Well, okay. The back to C, the 10 milligrams, <laughs> uh, the recommended dose I've seen was 10 milligrams once a week. So, yeah. So, what and, is that doing then? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly not hurting, right? I think that, the, you know, what, what we know with the mod C is that it's encouraging a lot of processes that are beneficial for, for as you mentioned, weight loss. And also performance, you know, leading to ACAR increases, which you know increases mitochondria and metabolic function. And so, um, so I think certainly ten milligrams is, is nothing to nothing bad about that. Um, but I think to to really see some of those benefits, uh, you would want to dose it much much higher um, wow. and much more frequently. Again, the half lives of these things are very very short. In the case of the mod C, even um, once you reconstitute it, um, it it it, de it degradates by ninety percent within four hours. Um, and so it is, uh, it is highly unstable, um, and quickly degraded, not just outside of the body once it hits liquid, but even inside the body. Um, and, and so I think that, uh, uh, that dosing is, is, is probably a little low. <laughs> okay. So, is, okay. I've heard other things about the degradation. So, um, uh, but y you guys have tested it in the, in the lab, I assume about the 90% degradation. Yeah, certainly. And and, uh, there, and and for what it's worth, that wasn't even our testing. That was actually published in one of the Mod C papers, 90% um, degradation within four hours. Okay. I, I, I think I've heard, you know, some other, you know, other opinions and some, on some podcasts, but, um, but you're yeah. pretty certain that that's the case because that, that makes a big difference about what you give patients. <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent certain. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, no, yeah, no, no doubt in my mind whatsoever um, uh, about the degradation. I'll even uh, send you that trial um, okay. so you can see it. Mm -hmm. So, do people feel a um, you know as far as energy level? Because a lot of people suffer from mm -hmm. low energy. 
um, by increasing their mitochondria function, do they notice an improved energy on lot C? Yeah, certainly. So um, I, I think that, especially again, a, a good dose thing, but you know, with the MOTC, you'll improve your insulin sensitivity, you'll improve your protection against diabetes. But I think some of the biggest things that people see is it, it's sort of like an exercise memetic because what we're doing, uh, whenever we, we give the MOTC, we're then sort of starting de novo purine synthesis, which leads to a, a byproduct called ACAR. And this is ACAR has been a product that she's been in, in sports doping for a long time. Um, but because what that does is it sort of activates the AMP kinase, which is the same process which is activated with exercise. Um, and once AMP kinase is activated, you can also activate something called PGC1 alpha. Um, and that increases mitochondrial biogenesis. And that's really what we want um, because it's driving those cellular energy processes. Um, and so that sort of loop and pathway uh, is just sort of positive regulating. And so you'll certainly feel that in terms of energy. Mm -hmm. And then there's another weight loss uh, peptide, 5-amino-1-MQ. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? And that also increases NAD level, right? And also help with mitochondria health, correct? Yeah, certainly. So, so I was actually the first person to ever take the uh, the five amino one MQ, um, and at that point, we were trying to do it as an injection, um, and it was awful. One of the most painful injections I've ever done. Um, but I I had seen the the data um, by Dr. Waterland um, come out of the University of Galveston, and and um, you know it was right around the same time that um, I would say that NAD and sirtuins were gaining a lot of popularity. Um, and so uh, the injections didn't work at all, but but uh, the uh, the oral products um, certainly uh, are, are something very good. And, and technically, it's a small molecule instead of a peptide, but it's one that I'm a very big fan of. So you don't think the injectable is a good form? No, I don't. And the reason being is that uh, I mean, it's one MQ is very uh, difficult to solubilize um, in water, and so um, so I think that the oral version is perfectly fine. You get bioavailability, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and it, it certainly works. Um, you know, we're even doing NAD testing with your diagnostic. I've seen the five you know one MQ increase that intracellular NAD level. Um, on that, some of the effects it has on muscle regeneration are are, are pretty exciting. Okay. And do people also notice increased energy level? Yeah, I, I would say that um, some people might. Um, I, I think that uh, one thing that I saw um, that was certainly unique is just improvements in performance. Um, I had some of the craziest uh, increases with performance that I've ever had with any type of product um, with the five amino. Um, and uh, and again, I, I had no idea why at this point. One of the, the first studies really just described it as a way to increase in AD. Um, and I had no idea why it was having so much of an effect on me from a performance aspect, mm. uh, but I loved it. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, a couple other papers came out showing the impact on skeletal muscle. Um, and uh, and that made a little bit more sense. Um, you know, it, it activates the satellite stem cells and muscle. Um, and so I think that uh, although some people might experience some energy benefits, I think the performance impacts are, are certainly something that uh, I think most people will feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, you know, maybe I have an improved version of the 5-amino-1 MQ. I'm not sure because it's highly soluble, looks beautiful, not painful yeah. when I inject. So I'm wondering if things have changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I would, I would, I would uh, be a little careful about the injectable. I, I know from experience. But one of the other things is that the 5-amino-1 MQ is usually given as an iodine salt. And sometimes, much like we talked about with the copper, if you give it too frequently or you bypass that first pass metabolism, um, you might increase iodine levels a little too high. Um, so something to, to take a look at there um, as well. But I should also mention there are new generations of the, the 5 amino one mq um, So shortly after um, its development, uh, actually Dr. Waterland created a spin-off company just to develop this product. Um, and they very quickly got pharmaceutical interests and are now on second and third generation versions of the same molecule that, um, that are in pharmaceutical development and will hopefully hit the market uh, over the course of the next decade. Hmm. Is that why the solution is like amber color is because of the iodine? Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And then the last um, weight loss peptide uh, is melanotan. So there's of course one <laughs> and two. Um, do they both have weight loss properties? They do, although the two has much more weight loss properties. But uh, I always like to mention that the melanotan one is actually FDA approved as mm -hmm. afemelanotide. How often 
do people get hyperpigmentation? You know, the the fact that their 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 you know pigments are getting a lot darker. You know, that may upset a lot of people. Yeah, I would say that uh, it's something to expect with the melanotan too. Um, okay. You would you you would not see it as much with the melanotan one, um, which is usually given as a pellet actually for vitiligo. Um, but uh, but with that being said, yeah, the melanotan two almost everyone should expect it, but it is also dose dependent. Um, and so, uh, for instance, I would say that uh, the more melanocytes you have, so generally the darker you are um, at baseline, the more you're going to experience that as a side effect. Oh. Um, uh, because uh, what it does is it stimulates your melanocytes, but you're, uh, but but obviously everyone has a very different amount of melanocytes, and so it'll affect some people differently. And I think that generally the biggest complaints are some of those mucous membranes will start to turn purplish, um, like your tongue or your lips. Um, and, and so, uh, or the sort of even make you the, under your eyes a little bit darker. Then the very important question is that reversible. <laughs> yes, absolutely reversible, but it takes time. You have to lose that melanin. Um, and, uh, and that can take some time, uh, certainly, but they're also for what it's worth peptides, which also can help, uh, lighten your skin as well. Um, and, and so, uh, some of those are in, in frequent and cosmeceutical ingredients, but, uh, some, some really interesting things happening there too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. And then, um, there are some, you know, a few other categories. Um, one is the, the brain peptides, which yeah. are very much in need, in need. I, you know, see how challenging brain conditions are and it's, they're absolutely important. So in your mind, I mean, there, there, there are various ones that I've seen research, you know, looking at different extracts from, um, from animals' brains, um, yeah. So the, I guess the most well-known one is the cerebral lysin, right? Yeah. Um, and of course people raise the question, how safe is it? Is, you know, is a pig brain extract and how would you answer that? I would say very safe. Um, very safe. The cerebral lysin, uh, especially if we getting it from a good source, which is important. Um, the cerebral lysin is approved in now over 70 countries. Um, mm -hmm. the United States is unfortunately not one of them. Um, but it is, uh, it has been approved by multiple countries for, for things like stroke or traumatic brain injury. Um, and, and so I am certainly a big fan of the cerebral lysin. I think it is very, very safe. Um, uh, one of the things I should mention is one of the big fears about brain related products or extracts is, or things like prions or mad cow disease type of things. And, and something that is interesting is that pigs are actually naturally prion resistant. Um, mm -hmm. they almost never get prions. And so you don't have to worry about anything like that. And most everything else is thoroughly tested for, um, in these pharmaceutical batch ingredients. And so, so I think true life is, is, is very, very safe. Wonderful. And mm -hmm. if you're treating somebody with you know, stroke, either acute or, or chronic a long time ago, um, what would be the dosing? Would you recommend daily dose for, you know, I I've seen protocol of like 16 weeks. Um, yeah. what do you think is the ideal way of using that? Yeah. So most of the clinical trials, which have been done using the cerebral ISM, do it as an IV infusion and those IV infusions can get to very, very high doses, um, you know, upwards of 50 milliliters uh, infused on a daily basis for every day for multiple days. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you can take very aggressive approaches, but I also think that it sort of shows you that there's, you really can't overdo it. Um, a lot of these, uh, you're, you're not going to overdose on these products. And so um, I think that it also, as I should say, in the research setting, really only been used or studied really acutely, usually within the first three to six months after some type of event. Um, and so a lot of what we might be able to do chronically and at what doses is still a little bit of a guess, but I think that what we've seen, at least anecdotally, is that you know one milliliter of the, uh, of the solution, which is usually at 215 milligrams per ml, is is consistently used and, and has gotten some really great effects. Um, but again, hasn't been widely studied as much as those big IV infusions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And something like daily injection of that one, one milliliter for 16 weeks, that sounds pretty reasonable. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. As I mentioned, you're not going to overdose it. And I think that that I've seen that doses work for quite a few people. Mm -hmm. And what kind of conditions have you seen, you know, people have that have gotten help for, from this? Yeah, so definitely uh, post-stroke. Um, uh, it's been one, probably one of the, the most frequent applications. Um, but even post-TBI, um, any traumatic brain injury of any type, 
Um, but even things like peripheral neuropathy, um, ha- I've seen that have some, some really great effects. Um, and, and so I would say those are certainly the three most common, but I mean, I've seen it used in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Um, there's some good studies on maybe some of the APOE4 biology, which it might have um, some beneficial effects on. So I think it has a lot of really positive effects across the um, neurological spectrum and then can really help with a lot of different things. But uh, mostly, uh, I would say uh, definitely in stroke or TBI. Mm, what about ALS or MS? Yeah, so I, I certainly uh, know a lot of people that are using it in those conditions. I myself don't have, I would say, a ton of experience there, but I've heard uh, certainly great things. Okay, mm-hmm. great. And then uh, another interesting peptide is dihexa. It's one of the few mm-hmm. that actually is taken orally. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, yeah. it's widely available. So, um, you know, people talk about the, was it 10 million times, produce, help you produce 10 million times more brain-derived neurotropic factor. Um, well, that sounds great, but in <laughs> practice, does that actually promote that much benefit? Um, so, so I, I, yes. And, and, uh, so yeah, 10 million times the potency of BDNF, um, it is mimicking angiotensin four, which we've known is a great, uh, sort of nootropic product for a long, long time. Um, and some of the results that I've seen with dihexa have been extraordinary. Mm. Um, one of my favorite, uh, things, if you're, if you're listening to this right now, um, I would recommend pausing it for a, a few seconds, going to Vimeo as a platform and searching Dr. Joseph Harding, um, uh, dihexa. Um, and I recommend looking at it because uh, there's a certain part of that video, which is uh, astounding. It's really one of the first times I came across Dihexa. Um, and what they actually are doing is they're inducing Parkinson's in mice. Um, and so they have a, a three mice here. They have one mouse that's normal. They have one mouse who Parkinson's has been induced upon. Um, and then they have a mouse that had Parkinson's induced but has been treated with Dihexa. And one of the ways that they test this is they uh, encourage the mice to hang from a rope. So they put their front two paws on a rope, almost like you're doing a pull up. Um, and then they just wait and see how long you can stay up. Um, and uh, it's extraordinary to see because as you would imagine, the Parkinson's uh, um, uh, mouse drops very, very quickly. Um, it's only really got one arm that they can do it and then it, it sort of drops off. Um, then you have the dihexa treated mouse and then the normal mouse. And uh, the normal mouse actually drops second, but by a wide margin. Uh, the, the dihexa treated mouse probably stays on that line um, twice as long as even the normal mouse. That's and incredible. it's yeah, it's incredible to see. And even before that, you can see some amazing pictures of, of the, the neuron growth with, with dihexa and some of these animals. And it is astounding how powerful it is. Um, and so uh, in, in a lot of times, brain diseases are very hard to treat. Yeah. Um, a lot of times because they don't have a lot of, uh, you know, this, the blood brain barrier, having targeted approaches um, in just the nature of these conditions are sometimes very difficult. So sometimes a heavy handed tool like the dihexa um, can be really good. But other times I can see that you probably wouldn't want that as much stimulation there, especially for things that are more of just nootropic based um, uh, benefits. Hmm. So for what conditions would you, I mean, Parkinson's, that, that sounds like that would be very appropriate. I've heard doctors who treat kids with autism, um, mm-hmm. they, they give them dihexa. So what yeah. kind of conditions have you seen people using it for? Yeah, I've seen people use it for the broad spectrum, everything from those TBIs and strokes we talked about to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's to even just trying to maintain cognitive function with age. Um, so I've seen people use it in a, in a variety of circumstances. I think probably the people who are, who are generally the most positive about it are the people who have the most serious conditions. Mm-hmm. And uh, have you heard of great results from practitioners? Uh, I have, but, but I would say it, sometimes it's, it's a little mixed um, in terms of uh, uh, the the responses. Some people might not experience anything. Other people will say it's life changing. And so um, I really think that uh, you know maybe we're not sure maybe the best indications yet. But I know that we we it's certainly a strong nootropic uh, and and uh, powerful brain product. Yeah. So the the PO dihexa goes across the blood brain barrier. That's no problem. Very easy, I assume. Correct. And it was made that way. Um, oh. and, and, and like I said, to mimic angiotensin four, but to be orally bioavailable and to get across the brain. Okay. All right. And then there are three other, um, brain peptides that I, I use in the clinic, um, C-Link, C-Max and P2228. Mm-hmm. So, and that's covering some grounds and I, I would love to hear your thoughts 
on these three. So let's say somebody comes in with anxiety. Um, which one would you grab first? Uh, certainly uh, the one with the most data on anxiety is the C-Link. Um, the C-Link uh, has been, been studied a couple times for anxiety and, and with the C-Max is one of those Russian peptides um, that's been around for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if somebody has uh, cognitive issues, ADHD, then definitely yeah. C-Max. Yeah, certainly. It's got definitely more studies in that as well. Again, another angiotensin making product. Um, but uh, but yes, the, the C-Max is definitely more for that acute nootropic effect. Yeah. Are you a fan of the PE2228? It's supposed you know, to alleviate yeah. depression what, in four days? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So, you know, I think that, so we were the first to roll out the PE2228 as a nasal spray, a tailor-made. Um, and, and I would say it never really took off like we would have expected it to. Um, and, and so, uh, I, I think that the mechanism of action is certainly one that's exciting because unlike, uh, the SSRIs where you have to wait several weeks to see any type of benefit, this is rather immediate. And with people now going to things like ketamine, uh, for treatment resistant depression, it seems like there might be a really great. Um, middle ground where it can be positive. Um, but I, I, to be honest with you, I, I did, we never saw it uh, uptick that much. And with the, the frequency and prevalence of depression, that surprised us a little bit. Um, so I do love the mechanism of action. Um, but, what you know, I, I, I. So to be honest with you, I don't remember as much now. It's been a while since we've, I've used <laughs> it. Um, but uh, I, if I remember correctly, it is. Um, I'll have to, I have it here, right here. Um, so uh, I'm not sure, but uh, but I know that it's it's working again uh, in almost in a, in a realm like ketamine um, in terms of its TREK1 inhibition. Um, but I, And I, I'm not sure sort of what activity that has directly on the brain, but I know it's TREK1. Mm, okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then we come to uh, like a couple of immune boosting peptides. So the T alpha one and LL 37. So I would love for you to, you know, give your, your thoughts on that. You know, a lot of people, I mean, autoimmune conditions or Lyme disease, you know, these are rampant and it's devastating. So what, what are your thoughts on these two peptides? Yeah. So, um, so I'll start with the thymus alpha one, because after the SS 31, it is one of my favorite products. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it again, is like the Cervelicin approved in multiple different countries. Um, and it's just, again, a, a great product for improving the immune system. Um, you know, even early in COVID, it was hypothesized to have a, a beneficial effect with COVID. Uh, it was actually even nominated for FDA approval here in the United States to be given um, as an adjuvant to vaccines to make them work better, um, as well as uh, to be used with certain types of cancers to help the immune system fight your own cancer. And mm -hmm. so the thymus stop one as an immune stimulant is a product I, I certainly like. Again, it's a natural product as well. Um, one of my other anecdotes that I always like to mention about that is that Thymus alpha one is upregulated significantly during pregnancy um, as a way to sort of uh, help the body's immune system function for, for essentially two people. Um, and so that's actually one of the biggest times we see massive increases um, of its own production um, it, it naturally. So um, I'm a huge fan of the thymus alpha one. I think it's very hard to, to dose it incorrectly or, or, or too often or um, for conditions, uh, almost any condition, it has a sort of a, an immune normalizing effect. So I'm a very, very big fan. Well, my um, question is, if you're coming down with a cold, if you ever come down with a cold, will you grab a Tialva one right away? <laughs> certainly. Yeah, certainly. Um, yes. Uh, I mean, definitely in those days of COVID, I was keeping it around. I'll tell you that for <laughs> sure. Um, but uh, yes. Yeah, so, so I think that, um, you know, it, it's ability to help with a, a multitude of, of, uh, of, of viral infections um, to help even, you know, with cancer improving the immune system and decreasing that immune essence that we see with age. Um, definitely a big fan of the thymus and alpha one. Um, and what about the LL37? Um, do you, how well do you think it has worked for chronic infections from you, what you've seen? I uh, am not as big of a fan of the LL37. Oh. Um, okay. uh, yeah. So, so I, I, again, uh, we were the first people to start doing this at TaylorMade and it's one of those ones I, I regret launching a little bit um, because uh, it's really, uh, again, it's an endogenously produced antimicrobial peptide, something that's naturally produced by our bodies. But the problem I think is um, dosing it systemically because uh, the L37 can activate seven different types of receptors, all with different mechanisms of action. And so um, knowing what receptors is actually activating and where it's actually activating 
is very, very complicated. And, and there have now been even um, more recent studies showing that um, LL37 uh, has been linked to things like uh, Alzheimer's, uh, among others. And so, again, I, I think linked, that- You mean causing? It, it does look to be causal instead of just correlative. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I can imagine why many people would think it'd be correlative because your body might want to upregulate antimicrobial peptides in types of uh, situations that might also then induce Alzheimer's. But it, it does look to have um, some, some causative effects um, and mechanism rather than just correlative. But again, it's, it's so hard to say because it has so many different impacts on receptors. Um, and these are big G-coupled protein receptors that, that have multitude of downstream effects. And so knowing what you're getting with the LL37 is sometimes very tough. But I think for things like topical administration, um, uh, you know, to fight, you know, staph or, or some of those other things, I, I certainly don't think is a bad idea. But um, antimicrobial peptides are probably one of the biggest growing areas in all of peptide development. And so I'm sure that if LL37 is not the one we like, we'll certainly find more. Yeah, it's very popular in the Lyme community. Everybody has heard about LL37. So, um, you know, now I'm a little concerned whether or not this is the best thing for, for these patients. Yeah, I'll send you some, I'll send you some, some information. Um, uh, but there was actually even just a study that was published uh, last year, 2022, um, which shows that uh, how it might have some negative effects in that human microglia. Mm, wow, okay. Good to know. Two more peptides. I know we're covering a lot of ground, <laughs> but um, yeah. So the the epitalon, and of course, is a lot of mm -hmm. people's favorite as well, right? Mm -hmm. It's been that's a bioregulator, a very powerful um, mm -hmm. molecule, and uh, and then there's another one, pinealon. So both are pineal mm -hmm. peptides. So can you talk a yeah. little bit about the difference, and would you use both? And like, you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I would say that I'm not an expert on the the um, the pineal, um, okay. and so I can speak a lot to the epitalon. I, I think that uh, I tend to be a bigger skeptic of those bioregulators than most, um, and uh, the reason being is that um, in Russia they're done a little bit more as a multi-level marketing um, type of application, and none of the sequences of the actual products are released. Um, so it's not really. I, I would say as scientific as some of these other approaches are, where we know exactly what the amino acid sequence are, we know exactly what the receptors are, which is targeting. And so for some of those bioregulators, I tend to be more skeptical. Um, but the epitalon is one that I think has a lot of great data, and I am a big fan of. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that there are some studies on epitalon I don't particularly uh, think are, are the best. Um, one in particular being the one that it is widely noted, which is that it increases telomerase and telomere length. Um, in, in one study, it increased uh, lung fibroblast telomere length by 33%. Um, and, uh, and so I think a lot of people early on started doing it as a way to, to improve telomere length. Um, but unfortunately, I can say that I've tested now uh, quite a bit of tel tel telomere lengths uh, with, with epitalon, and I don't see that big of a correlation. Um, I, I actually don't see it having much of an impact, but I think I am a huge fan of it for all the other effects that it has. Um, even those 15 year follow-up studies where we're seeing, you know, some, some really drastic improvements in, in, uh, in, in lifespan and in reducing cardiovascular disease. Um, I think that there is uh, certainly some benefit, um, although I think that mechanism of action is still a little bit uh, uh, unelucidated. I see. So you're collecting a lot of data with the, the true age testing. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen any peptides that's making a dent on biological age? So we're doing a study right now, a controlled study on the epitalon. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of uh, our data on the peptides is, is, is not very strong um, because most of the time if people are doing one peptide, they're usually doing several. Um, and, and so it's always hard to, to pull around which one is having the biggest impact. Um, and so, uh, so we're actually gonna be start doing that um, right now, a study on epitalon to look at some of the biological age impacts and the methylation effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, so I just um, maybe we'll just quickly talk about um, you know kind of the looking at the the grand future um, before we wrap up. Um, you know, I have this this thought that uh, if uh, if the government and big pharma doesn't stand in the way, um, I think peptides peptide therapy can you know peptides can replace probably about seventy percent of the medications that we're using. So that's just kind of but, you know, just my sense looking at the natural abilities for the body to heal. 
and and the incredible number of peptides that exist in our body. So, um, what's your um, what's your thoughts on on, on my conjecture? <laughs> I, I think you're you're certainly right. I think that. Um, I think that that it really, in order to, to make that a, a realistic possibility, we have to go back to treating preventatively, right? Hoping to restore dysfunction before it gets so out of control that that uh, it becomes something else, that it comes comes a disease entirely. And so, I think that a lot of the peptides are great at having um, some marginal shifts to a more natural state, and I think that that's certainly a positive thing. And and unfortunately, I think that um, uh, the United States doesn't have a really great um, uh, legal or, or system at the moment, which would really advocate for the use or exploration of these. Um, I think that we're really going to be reliant uh, eventually on big pharma because compounding pharmacies like us, for instance, the Taylor made compound are being uh, forced to stop a lot of compounding of these products. And so I think that's a very sad thing as I, I've seen how much uh, they, they help a, a multitude of people. So I'm hoping that changes. Um, but I think peptides is a class of molecule, whether or not it's being brought by big pharma or compounding pharmacies, um, I think uh, you're, it's going to be hard pressed to find an area where we don't see many new peptides being developed. Right. So, um, so I I see that you also work with international pharmacies. Uh, do a lot of them see much more at latitude? <laughs> certainly, certainly. So, uh, yeah, I'm compounding uh, with pharmacies in Mexico and in Thailand. Um, now we're starting one in the Philippines as well as several in, in the Middle East. And and thankfully, yes, they have a, a much more latitude. And so uh, we're actually, I would say, expanding the frontier of, of peptide products. Really, since we stopped TaylorMade, there haven't been any new peptides introduced into the market. None of the compounding pharmacies are doing really anything innovative. They're only doing what we did at TaylorMade Compounding. Mm. Um, but with some of these international pharmacies, we're able to do some other really exciting things. Uh, you know, we're doing the uh, the red uh, sort of a new GL1, a, a little bit more um, uh, advanced than the uh, tirosipatide or even the the, the uh, ozempic or the semaglutide. We're doing some things like growth hormone screwdrivers orally, like the anamorelin. Um, so some really uh, cool new products uh, that are happening and, and we're starting to learn a little bit more. So I think a lot of the development we're seeing now is going to be more international than it is going to be domestic, uh, which is unfortunate. But at the same time, I think that I'm glad to see the development continuing. Yeah, this is so exciting. Well, you are uh, making a great contribution to uh, humanity. You are <laughs> in a lot of people's lives. This is just in incredible using your knowledge and your, your, your courage and, and uh, your resourcefulness. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, thank you. I, you, you as well. I, unfortunately, I, I quit when the going got tough, but I'm glad to see that there are still people out there using these in patients' lives to improve them. And so, uh, so I'm glad that uh, to see that it's still alive and well. Yeah, I'm just so excited that I, I finally <laughs> brought in peptide to my stem cell therapy. You know, I think stem cells is yeah. very powerful in this overall elevation of the capability for the body to heal. Of course, there's, there's some targeted action too. But the peptides just add so much, you know, tools for me to pinpoint what area I can further address. It just, uh, it, it's making it really fun. Yeah. So thank you yeah. for paving the way. Yeah, no, 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 no problem at all. And for what it's worth, okay. I actually have a presentation on all, all of the peptides used with stem cells. Um, so I'll send that to you as well. <laughs> oh my God, I love that. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, Ryan. So where can people find you and follow you? And uh, I'm sure people are very impressed. I remember the first time I heard you on a podcast, I was like, <laughs> well, okay, this guy is super sharp. Yeah, th this is a very smart guy. Yeah. So I'm sure people will be interested in, you know, keep learning from you. Yeah. Well, I would love to, to share any information that I have. Um, the best way to contact me now is email with my new company, True Diagnostic at ryan at truediagnostic.com. Um, and, you know, again, although I'm not doing peptides all the time anymore, um, I still have a ton of information. So a ton of literature, a ton of presentations. And so if I can share any of those to help anyone, I'm, I'm more than happy to. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for all you do. Yeah. And I'm yes. so glad we're having a, we had such a detailed and, and interesting <laughs> conversation. Yeah, certainly. Thanks so much for having me, Dr. Kong. You're so welcome.